Andrew, it's Friday. It is November the 6th, actually, and it is 1.38 because we are always we always like to do this show on a on a time that is like weird. 1.38. Yeah, and it's now TV, so it's always now on now TV. Not not much of a week, Keith. I guess it was a quiet week on the uh, the world history front, right? It was a it, it was um it was a, a strange week. I'd predicted a Biden landslide. I know you said that to me privately. At least you're admitting you were wrong. I was wrong. And um, was it, did I predict anything, or was I just sort of ambivalent? You you never put yourself in a place where you might be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about. Let me let me just cue this up if uh, if I can. It's going to go on the other side of the screen. You can see it there. Right. Uh, this, this, this week's theme is uh, playing with fire, how to break the internet, which um, which is all about Section 230 of the Communications Act, which can sound a little bit dry. And, right. Um, well, let's, to begin, because we've, we've, we've talked about this before, but we've never dedicated a whole show. For the benefit of people who are still slightly confused, Keith, define what Section 230 is. Well, so S Section 230 goes back to 1995, 1996, when the, uh, the internet uh, was a challenge to the authorities because it was a brand new way for people to say what they thought. And there were all these new companies and protocols that allowed them to do that. Um, the hardest thing of all was protocols. There were like HTTP and the web is a protocol. Email, SMTP is a protocol. And people were publishing in a protocol called NNTP, which were news groups, all kinds of points of view. And um, uh, internet service providers got approached by authorities saying, you know, we can't let people say whatever they want on these things. We want you to control it. And that led to a conversation about what is the responsibility of an internet company for controlling what their users say and do. So hold on, I, I have to, I wouldn't say disagree, but firstly, you're approaching this very much from a, a personal point of view, which I understand, but you happen to run a, a, an internet service provider in the UK. Let's be clear, yeah. section 230, firstly, it's an American thing. So it's got nothing to do with Britain. No, Britain does have its okay, own. Okay, well, but leave, leaving aside, let's let's not let, let's just focus on Section Two Hundred and Thirty. Yeah, and I so didn't, I didn't mention Britain, by the way. You did. Well, yeah, but because because you you're using your example of the British ISP, but I would I would if I was defining it, I'm not saying I think your your definition isn't necessarily wrong, but you're getting into the weeds. I my understanding of Two Hundred and Thirty is it was designed by Congress to, um, to give legal protection to internet startups because they bought into the idea, for better or worse, that these plucky little companies needed some extra legal provisions to survive in their competition with big media at the time, big media in the 90s being traditional media. Is, is that a fair way of looking at it, do you think? I don't think they really cared about these plucky little companies. I, I think they cared about what were the rights, responsibilities, and obligations of the different stakeholders in this new technology. Who, who uh, I, 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 maybe you don't know the answer to this, but who actually sponsored and penned Section 230? Um, let me ask you a question. Who was the president in 1994-95? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to find out. Clinton. I assume. The answer uh, is Bill okay. Clinton. You are correct. Right. So Bill Clinton. So it was uh, clearly, uh, it predated the Democratic administration that started. Yeah. Running. As we're speaking, I'm going to do a live, uh, I'm going to do a section 230 on my favorite user generated platform, Wikipedia. Let's see what they say. Um, so, 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 um, 
of the commu and let's be clear of of the communications decency act it, it seems indecent anytime americans mention decency i always assume they're indecent in some way yeah else. well you I'm know right. there's a long history of litigation around decency around right so interestingly enough it was the framers of um of 230 were chris cox and ron wyden who is probably of all the congressmen still the most vocal supporter of an open internet so it was designed to create and protect internet companies i i think it was definitely designed to do that but it wasn't so much the companies as the internet itself the the belief was the internet um, openness was what made it valuable. And so if you didn't protect the companies, you actually threatened the thing itself. Okay, right by that, that's fair enough. So, um, so uh, now the other element of it... But, but just to be clear, and I'm, I'm quoting from Wikipedia here, um, and they're quoting, it said, coupled with the Digital Millennial Copyright Act, DMCA of 1998, Section 230 provides internet service providers, your ISPs, which you ran in the, in, in the late 90s, safe harbors to operate as intermediaries of content without fear of being liable for that content, as long as they took reasonable steps to delete or prevent access to that content. So now uh, that, that last it's the, safe, it's the safe harbor thing that's the key, right? And well, they, they call it safe harbor. Read, read the last subclause of the sentence again. Um, as long as. As long as they take reasonable steps to delete or prevent access to that content. Okay, so, so before 230 existed, they didn't have to do that. They had Safe Harbor already as common carriers. And, and, and so what this did is it took the common carrier Safe Harbor that had come from the telephone age uh, and modified it to put an obligation on ISPs to intervene to delete or whatever where required. So 230 had two elements. One was the safe harbor, but that wasn't new. What was new was the interventionist part of it. So just to be clear, are you, I get the sense sometimes you're saying that section 230 um, was designed to give the authorities permission to ask for things to be changed. Authorities being the platforms or the government? Uh, the, what, the police usually um, uh, are a court. But I think you may need to step back a little bit as because ultimately the impact of 230 hasn't been on ISPs. It's been on platforms. Yeah. So let's let's just talk a little bit about how the internet's evolved. So on, on day one, ISPs had portals. They weren't called portals, but we all had landing pages all right. and subscribers could come and sign up and stuff like that. Um, very quickly, within 12 months, you had the Yahoo directory right. and AltaVista. Right. And shortly after that, you had Google and MSN uh, AOL became an internet company instead right. of a, a bulletin board and so on. And you had portals. Right. Um, now, these things all evolved to replace the underlying news protocol. Uh, NNT, NNTP, which still exists today, kind of disappeared. And content, instead of being on the internet, started to be on the internet inside portals. Uh, and if you roll the clock forward still, we move from the page-based, web page-based portal like Yahoo, we move to Web 2.0 and RSS, right. and then content got distributed. So very simply, just because we, we want to move along here and get to the articles that you've, you've highlighted for this week. Yeah. Very simply, the ISP got transformed into portals like AOL, and then we got Web 2.0 and Google and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And what has happened in the mean, two things have happened in the meantime. Lots of things have happened over the last 25 years, but very two seems to me critical things have happened 
since the, the original passing of, of Section 230. Firstly, these little internet companies have become massive global corporations, some of the most powerful co companies in the world and, and most valuable. And secondly, the impact of the content published on these platforms is increasingly controversial in terms of our politics and culture. Some people are critical, some aren't. So this is increasingly a, a major political issue. Is that fair? Would you agree with those two things? Yeah, yeah. It's become a massive issue. Um, it, 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 you know, if you narrow down your focus to the last few weeks, the Republicans are playing the role of the free speechers, criticizing Twitter and Facebook for labeling conservative content or removing right. it or slowing it down. And the, the Democrats are playing the role of um, uh, wanting to control honesty and truth. Right. And for uh, seeking to intervene in what is on these platforms. Right, but to, to, again, to be, and we don't want to fall into too many political traps here, but it would be fair to say that both Democrats and Republicans are increasingly critical of the power of these big companies, and it seems as if their lack of accountability and responsibility when it comes to what gets published on their network in terms of propaganda and lies and all the rest of it. So the, the push to change Section 230 is coming both from left and right in the sense that they see these platforms as unaccountable and irresponsible and actually damaging democracy. Is that fair, do you think? I'm not saying they're I, right, but is I that think it was fair? fair or... it, it was fair up until the last sentence because you can't really characterize all the different points of view in a single sentence. It's too hard because there's too many. Well, I think it would but, be fair to say that um, uh, they're, they're, everyone's troubled by the fact that it's see. I mean, the, the critics anyway of Section 230 are troubled by the fact that. There doesn't seem to be accountability for Facebook or Twitter taking stuff down that people don't like or see as being damaging. Is that fair? I, I, you know, that is fair, but it, you have to contextualize it. Nobody disputes, I don't think anybody really disputes, that Facebook and Twitter as private companies have a total right to have terms and conditions and apply them any way they want. Right. So I think that's kind of a common... Yeah, thing. that's not it. We're not debating that. So then the next thing is, when they do that, do you object or do you not? Um, and, uh, and and I think the answer is it depends... Well, but on... let's go... I mean, let's... And, go and then the next... To, but let's go back to Section 230. So what... And, and, and your newsletter this week has done a great job aggregating a series of really interesting arguments and observations about regulating, uh, you call regulation in the internet, but focusing particularly on 230. Um, it seems to me as if even, you know, uh, uh, venture capitalists like Albert Wenger and David Sachs, they're acknowledging that there may be a need to tinker with 230. Is that fair? Keith has been destroyed by 2.30. He's been brought down. Still here. Uh, um, so let's, ju let's just quickly go through the articles. I'll, I, I'll, okay. um, I, uh, I, I'll maximize the, uh, the page so we can, we can see it. Um, firstly, you've, you've got the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is critical of the companies, strangely enough. Um, uh, it, it, it basically wanted the Senate to be harder on these companies than uh, than, than it has been. Why, strangely enough? Well, because the EFF stands for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and it was it is a champion of the open internet and free speech. But well, I don't see any contradiction there. Um, the big I, internet companies. I, mean, I would, 
I don't know. I haven't always seen eye to eye with uh, the EFF, but I, I, I think they're absolutely right. I think that the key. So, what do you think about this, Andrew? They're saying the big internet companies are too powerful, but undermining two thirty won't help. So they're basically so focused they on. They're focusing on antitrust as a better way to deal with them, okay. rather than two thirty. That's the EFF. David Sachs, um, uh, basically has an article titled Mend It, Don't End It. And Bill Gurley praised him for a super well-researched and written piece, a must read. So what does he say, David? And, and, and he's basically saying um, 230 is good because it provides safe harbor, but you need more definition around what is and what is not okay. That's if you were to summarize it in a nutshell. Hmm. Um, if we click on it, it's a medium piece. Um, and uh, he puts it in the context of democracy, free press, the news media. He's, he, he acknowledges that there's a certain bipartisanship. Hmm. He, he goes through 230 uh, and explains why it's there. Um, and uh, he, he, he says the better approach would be to clean up the second provision of 230 by removing the phrase otherwise objectionable and altering that final clause that presently reads whether or not such material is constitutionally protected. Right. In other words, he, he basically wants to um, almost delegalize it. And he get, he goes on to talk about the First Amendment as being what really is in play here. Yeah. Now, that's also what Mike Masnick does. Mike Masnick says, your problem is not with Section 230, but the First Amendment. And he's basically saying what you guys really object to is is people saying what they think when you disagree with them. Um, so you're actually questioning First Amendment rights. You're not actually questioning 230. That's just the ruse. Yeah, and I, I, think, trust, I have to say I trust um, I trust uh, Sachs a lot more. I mean, Masnick's always seemed a bit dodgy to me. I always assumed that Google and Facebook are paying his checks, but who knows? And then you've got Albert Wenger, who, right, who's a friend, and I definitely trust him. And he's saying the coming fight for the control of the internet. In other words, this isn't actually about 230. It isn't even only about the First Amendment. It's about the internet as an open platform. Um, and uh, he goes on to talk about how that's been a problem for a long time. He's, he's not uncritical of Facebook and Twitter, mm. but he wants to posit, uh, posit it what he calls a later and broader iteration of slowing down tweets is, is a step in the right direction. So he's certainly in favor of them having the right to intervene. Right. But he's worried about the future of the internet. That is what my editorial is all about. Uh, but, but Keith, you say at the beginning a wide range of points of view. You haven't included anyone in that who's actually in favor of ending Section 230. So it's not really very wide, is it? I'm pretty sure, tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm not sure anyone actually is in favor of ending I it. am. I would strongly argue that it's a, it, it may have been okay at the time. Now it's, I'm, I strongly believe these companies should be accountable. They shouldn't have safe harbor. So, you know, but there are a lot of people who argue that, a lot of people both on the left and the right. So I think if you're going to have an open discussion, you've got to acknowledge that there are credible arguments for ending Section 230 and giving this protection to these huge companies under the law. I just, I don't so, know why. So, I, don't, I don't know even know why. Well, let's talk about, about let's go with that. And Andrew, let's go with that. Let's imagine the, what you want happened. Um, firstly, it wouldn't remove Safe Harbor. Safe Harbor predates 230. And the legal argument in favor of Safe Harbor is you can only punish the publisher, not the platform they publish on. So Safe Harbor is pre-exists 230 and would not go away if 230 was removed. So what you, happens if 230 is removed? So, okay, so... Well, what happens is if, two, if 230 is removed, uh, the First Amendment to the Constitution kicks in as the only legal framework that you could re relate to. So think... What would that mean? And I want it's a genuine question. How tell me well, how you what I would like to see. Maybe I'm simplifying this thing, but what I would like to see is these platforms having the same accountability 
as a newspaper or a radio station um, or a Hollywood studio uh, in terms of what they can and can't publish. Uh, and I don't think that's that unreasonable. Well, it's hard for me. It's it's hard for me because, you know, let's say I publish something in the New York Times op-ed and the yeah. New York Times agrees to publish it. Yeah. Um, who's liable if it falls foul of the law in some way? The New York Times is. Correct. Now, let's say I publish something on Facebook, but no one in Facebook approves it and chooses to print it. It just goes out because that's the nature of the platform. Who's liable? Now or if you get rid of two? Well, who, who should be liable, in your opinion? In my, uh, my opinion, Facebook should be liable. And I think that's just the difference. I, I accept that I'm liable. Well, but, but, but let's go back to business models. The reason why Facebook's liable, because they're in the business of publishing this content and monetizing it. And so just as they can benefit from the upside, they should also be accountable in the same way as the New York Times sells newspapers. And if someone chooses to buy the newspaper, that's great. They make money, but they are responsible for what get published. And if they publish illegal stuff, then they're accountable. And I, I think this would be great, actually. Uh, you know, this idea that it's the end of the internet. Internet's not going to fall down. Well, the end would be that it would have forced people to change their business models. Let's let's think of a company like Medium. I actually think if you did away with Section 230, it would be a huge opportunity for someone like Medium because they're able to combine the open access of the internet with much more accountability. So no, no, I publish on Medium and no one edits or approves it. But I think that if 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 section 230 came to an end, someone like Ev Williams at Medium could reshape that platform and make it more and curate it, but rem, re, I mean the beauty of Medium is you can is that you can just publish on it. The, 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 the technology is wonderful. So yeah. all you would add is an extra piece where someone would have to read it and approve it. So let me, let me uh, just out of interest, let me, I'm going to add back in my uh, newsletter. Uh, I published my newsletter on a service called Ghost. Ghost is like WordPress. It's a, it's a platform that lets me create a yeah. subscriber publication. Um, Medium has copied a lot of the features of Ghost and vice versa. Yeah. yeah. Is Ghost responsible for what I publish? Well, that comes back. It's basically their ISPs, right? I mean. Well, not really. They're a software layer above the ISP providing publishing tools. I think they have, I think they should have a degree of responsibility depending on the business model. I don't know what the business model of Ghost is. I mean, Medium, for example, um, shares the profits of views with the author. So they should also share the risk. Um, so if Medium gives me X percent of views, which they do because I publish on Medium, then there needs to be a, another kind of arrangement where we share accountability. Someone has to be accountable for this stuff. If we're... Uh, well, I, I think I agree with you that the publisher is always accountable. And the only thing we disagree with is who is the publisher. Yeah, but that's sort of your Hegelian logic. I mean, <laughs> I mean it's semantic, right? I mean... That's a compliment to, to, right. to, to so, credit uh, me with understanding Hegelian logic is a wonderful... Uh, so it's def defense. I mean, but what, what we would are you... all publishers and we all publish on publishing platforms too. And the internet is a giant publishing platform at the sort of, at the bottom layer. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it, that becomes a semantic issue, but I, yeah. I do think that, do you think, I mean, I know we don't want to talk about Biden and Trump and all the rest of it, but do you think that presumably there's going to be a Biden presidency is that going to result in heightening or cooling the 230 debate? 
I, I think that what will happen is uh, the debate will move to antitrust. Um, uh, yeah, we 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 we, are, we really we haven't got time to talk about it, but yeah, if you look at news of the week, uh, regulation of the internet, most of it's about two thirty, but actually the first two pieces, right, uh, by Sophia Kantara in um, Crunch Crunchbase News, the SEC changes crowdfunding regulation. Right. That's allowing companies to raise up to five million dollars without complying with SEC rules. That's brand new. Yeah, that's a big deal. And, and that and supporting that's a kind of financial version of Section Two Hundred and Thirty, trying to stimulate innovation, which yeah. everyone, no one's going to argue against that. And then the second article is from Benedict Evans, market definitions and tech monopolies, and he goes to great lengths in a very good piece to say how hard it is to justify the idea that any of the big internet companies have monopolies once you ask the question, what is the market they monopolize? Um, uh, and, and so that's a good piece. So I, I anticipate the debate will move from Section 230, which I think is a fairly tactical debate based around current politics, to antitrust, right. which is the more substantive. And I, and I would, I would um, if, if the internet was a more open platform, if it wasn't a winner-take-all place, which is basically controlled by a handful of, of American companies and Chinese companies, then I would actually, I would be more, more, less sympathetic to Section 230. So I think you're right. I think antitrust and Section 230 are kind of, politically, they're kind of the same thing. Everyone's trying to, on the one hand, make these huge companies more accountable. And secondly, allow for more innovation, breaking them up, allowing people, startups more chance to succeed, which is what the whole point of Section 230 was in the first place, back well, it, in 1997. It, it would not be that was the week without Keith Tier and Andrew Keane having an interesting conversation. I think we've been pretty good, though. I think we've sort of, we've, we, we haven't come to blows on this one. We haven't come to blows. We have subtle differences that actually lead to wide differences uh, at, at a tactical level. But I think ultimately we both agree publishers should be liable for what they publish. And on that note. And we want, and we're in favor of innovation. We want startups. I mean, I, mean, I think one of the things that is clear, particularly from this election, is that we need a thousand intellectual flowers to bloom uh, uh, on the on the internet anyway. And and that needs to happen if, if but it needs, I think at least it needs to be curated. You may disagree. But the more innovation we get intellectually and, and, and entrepreneurially, the better. Absolutely. And uh, that, so uh, two things. Number one, you can go to uh, our uh, website, that was the week.com, and you can subscribe. Uh, it's free. Uh, and uh, point number two, uh, you can also, if I can find the right one to click on, go to our Telegram channel where in real time, every day of the week, we publish the stories of that day. And I think Andrew and I might end up having a daily show based off of that. Let's see. Uh, I don't know if I can stand spending every day with you, Keith. Uh, finally, tweet of the week. Well, not finally. We always, I love your, you've got two lovely features in this. Uh, startup of the week and tweet of the week. What's your startup of the week? Uh, so my startup of the week this week is a company called Fast. Um, uh, and uh, I just didn't know you were going to go there, so I just went to Tweet of the Week. But let, let, let's no, turn no, I hope you went there fast. Let's Keith. turn this on. Fast is, uh, guess who the venture capitalist is? The venture capitalist is Stripe, which is a multi-billion dollar decacorn. Yeah, um, I thought it was going to be, I was, thought it was going to be Paul Graham. We haven't met um, him today. I wonder what he thinks about Section 230. So a hat tip to Lolita Torb, who's a Latinx investor. Yeah. Um, Stripe have invested in this company um, between 50 and 200 million, which is a pretty wide spread, valuing the company at over a billion. And fast, it will become as no surprise, is a fintech company. So they get startup of the week because it's a decacorn investing in a unicorn, which has got to be a first. That is startup of the week. And if we go back, the tweet of the week, this week is not a tweet at all. 
it is from Oren Hoffman, who was actually an investor in Edgia, one of one of my companies back uh, in the not, day. Not an, untru- un, not an uncontroversial fellow, Oren Hoffman. Not an uncontroversial yeah, fellow. He's a fellow in person. His his business operations are a bit dodgy, I think. I don't actually think Oren's dodgy in any way at all. He's interesting. Anyway, that said, we don't want to be subject to Section 230, so we let's not say more about that. We're going to get sued now. Um, he said... When a venture capitalist says your TAM is too small, they really mean your TAM is too small. And for those who don't know, TAM is total addressable market. So when when Andrew goes to pitch Now TV to VCs and they say your TAM is too small, what they're actually saying is one of the following. A, your TAM isn't big enough, which is the least likely. B, we don't understand your business, which is more likely. C, your product is not great, which is even more likely still. Or D, we don't like your team, which is the biggest of all. And so VCs can't be trusted as for their reasons for saying well, no. It's like, but, you know, VCs are human too. And to, in, uh, not that I'm, a, I, I'm far from being a defender of VCs, but it's very hard to tell people that their life's work is shit. And it's like when you meet a girl or a boy and you're dating and you decide you don't want to see them anymore. You don't say your you, your breath smells or you're ugly or you're bad in bed. You say, well, I need a bit of time or, uh, you know. It's not I, you, it's me. Right. Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so, so VCs have a right, I think, to euphemistically duck out. And if they say their TAM is too small... Uh, then that's a nice, polite euphemism for not investing. Isn't that fair? It is. Oren might show up again because he's he's doing these nice little pen sketches, and uh, he's got Oren. Your your tam is too small. We need you on the show to show off your tam. With that said, um, it is now time to do this. <laughs> <laughs>